loving that we're reconnecting literally legitimately for the first time (laughs) right now in the middle of a global pandemic. It's amazing. I mean, what better time to bring us back together? (laughs) I know. It's so good. I met Allison in Peru seven years ago when both of us were in completely different places in our lives. (laughs) Oh gosh, yeah. So much growing up, spiritually growing up, humanly growing up. Um, evolving, expanding. And now um, she's gone off and become a doctor of Chinese medicine. Is that how you say it? I'm Well, I'm not a doctor. So we have okay. in Chinese medicine, you get a four-year master's degree, which essentially should be a doctorate. But it, where things are in the United States right now, it's moving into like a five-year master's and doctorate co- combination. Okay. Um, so I can't technically call myself a doctor, um, but just practitioner of Chinese medicine, I guess is how you. Would okay. Be. Amazing. Yeah. And, um, uh, can you explain for anyone watching who doesn't know anything about Chinese medicine? Can you just give like a brief overview of what we're even talking about when we say traditional Chinese medicine or TCM or any of the buzzwords that we all totally. use about it? Totally. So traditional Chinese medicine is over 5,000 years old. It is, it encompasses several things. It's Chinese herbal medicine is a huge part of it. Acupuncture and body work. Um, so we kind of do a mix of all of those things. I, I am a huge herbalist. That's really my passion is herbal medicine. So I'll probably talk a lot about that. Um, yeah. but so it's based in Taoist philosophy. So a lot of it, I mean, a lot of, a lot of buzzwords people have heard of like yin and yang, um, things like that. But essentially what it comes down to, um, there's a couple of principles that it comes down to. And one of the biggest ones is living in balance and living in accordance with nature and the, and the natural elements around you. Um, so it's, it's not just a medicine, it's a lifestyle. And I know even for me studying it, I, it's totally changed my life and the way that I live my life. Um, and so that's kind of my goal as a practitioner of Chinese medicine is to help other people tune in to, uh, nature around them and what their body constitution is, is needing and how to counterbalance those things to find uh, more balance internally. So, um, mm-hmm. for example, we look, we look at, this is the best way I can explain it. So we look at the body internally, the way that we look at nature outside. So for example, some people are born with a dry and hot body, kind of like a desert. Some people are born with a hot and humid body. Some people are born with a cold and damp body, um, just like outside. And so uh, when I'm treating people, um, I will use things like tongue and pulse diagnosis to figure out what kind of body constitution they have. Um, You can be born with a certain body constitution, but then over time with different lifestyle choices, diet, Um, things like that, your body constitution can kind of change. And it can also be affected by the climate you live in. Um, So for example, I grew up on the East Coast of the US in North Carolina. It's very hot and humid there. When I moved to Texas a few years ago, my body got so dry, my skin so dry, my hair so dry, because I grew up in humidity. So my body constitution is used to that, that dampness and that humidity. So when I moved to Texas, it was like a shock to my body. And still, even a few years later, I've been here for five years. I, my body's still not acclimated because I spent my entire life in a humid climate. Um, wow. So I actually that, totally get that. that. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. So I, I explain that. I explain it to people like that. And it's, there's things that you can do, especially with nutrition, lifestyle, herbal medicine to counterbalance that. So for mm-hmm. example, if I moved to Texas, I could take um, herbs or eat food that are more damp in nature to help kind of counterbalance and help my body keep balance as I'm transitioning climates. Does that make sense? Yes. And I love that because I grew up in Chicago where it is, I mean, it's humid for part of the year, but most of the year it is not humid. And every time I live in a humid climate, I struggle a little bit. Um, like I'm in the tropics right now and I always end up having a little bit of like heaviness and like, you know, just like tiredness and whatnot, because my body's not used to the damp heat. Yeah. And then, I mean, in, in regards to like COVID and what we're seeing right now, we Mm -hmm. look at pathogens in the same way. So certain flu or cold, um, they have different temperatures and different, and different, um, elements. So this virus itself is actually being looked at in Chinese medicine as a damp pathogen. So, okay. 
it thrives in colder and damper environments, which is why we see it um, kind of coming up really quickly in places like Wuhan and places like Seattle and New York, because those climates are a little bit more damp and a little bit more cooler. Um, so, you know, when, when thinking about the treatment of that, that's something to consider as well. So this is interesting to me because we've been talking a lot about why it hasn't taken hold strongly in Southeast Asia. Like it's kind of blowing my mind because we walk past markets and stuff and the ties are still out and about as if nothing is happening in the world. Um, whereas in New York right now, you can't even go outside, you know, everyone's so like doing all these things to keep themselves from getting it. And so we keep talking about what is that, you know, like, why is it not taking hold in certain places? And I'm one, we, one of our theories was the climate. Another was vitamin D that we've seen thrown around, um, mm-hmm. and exposure to sunlight. But, um, I'm curious what your take on that would be. Definitely. I mean, what's, what's the climate like right there, right now there? It's, it's hot and damp, but it's not as hot and damp as it will get in a few months. It's kind of like their winter right now. Okay. Yeah. So, I mean, the climate probably has something to do with it, but I think also there's a couple of other factors. There's the, the factor of, I think epidemics are much more, uh, much more of a common occurrence in that part of the world. And so I think that part of the world is a little bit more accustomed to how to handle them. And also um, the preventative medicine and like the nutrition is different than it is here in the United States, for example, or in the West. Um, So I think that's a factor as well. Um, But I think the vitamin D for sure. Um, But with, with the vitamin D also, again, nutrition, I mean, if you think about the way that people eat and the lifestyles they live, I think that affects it very, very significantly as well. So I think so too. Um, the ties are actually pretty healthy considering, you know, like in the, the overall sense. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, we've been really fascinated by that. Like, cause we, at first, when it first started taking off in the U S we were like, oh my gosh, it's going to take off here any minute, you know, like, and it just hasn't yet, you know, thank God. But, um, you know, there's got to be some factors contributing to that somehow. Well, and in um, the U.S. too, one thing that I'm really concerned about as far as our outcomes go in the U.S. is that um, we actually have a population uh, that has extremely damp constitutions here. So people's bodies are very damp, which I, I can, it's kind of one of the, it's one of the more hard concepts in Chinese medicine to translate into layman's terms or modern, modern Western terminology. but essentially dampness is like the coagulation of body fluids and, and the, the inappropriate movement of body fluids throughout the body. So like lymph flow, blood flow, all of these things. Um, when you have like a sedentary lifestyle and you're not eating healthy, your fluid metabolism slows down and fluids start co- coagulating and collecting in parts of your body. Um, and so if people are overweight, that's always in our book, a sign of dampness in the body. So the body has become kind of more humid and stagnant and, and fluids are co- coagulating in places and they're not moving optimally. So if you look mm-hmm. at our population here in the U S the, the obesity rate is 42% in adults. And so we have an entire population of damp people, and then we have a damp pathogen and so if you have a damp pathogen come into an environment that's already excessively damp, it exacerbates that. So it creates yeah. just a complete storm, essentially. So yeah. there's that too. There's the body constitution. And like when I'm referring to like the lifestyle and the nutrition choices, that's what I'm referring to is just that, that body type too. That makes a lot of sense. So what would you recommend? Um, I mean, obviously we've said like exercise and eat well but can you give like more specifics about like what that would really mean or like the way that people could even just be taking care of themselves to lower their chances of this taking hold for them? Yeah. So, I mean, you know, all of the information that we have right now is still really, really new. And there's a lot of speculation because this virus just, we don't know a lot about it at this point. Um, but as far as, you know, first thinking about a virus, like physiologically, a virus needs a perfect environment, a perfect host to replicate and to thrive. So um, I always think about the microbiome in the gut when it comes to that and like actually having a good balanced gut. So um, 
eating things that are easy on the digestion. I think um, for me, a big thing that I would tell patients is eating warm things, especially first thing in the morning to get your metabolism going and making sure that those those foods and fluids are being processed and you're giving your, your metabolism a kickstart. Um, one thing that we prescribe a lot in Chinese medicine for that is congee. I don't know if you're familiar with that. Um, it's basically like a rice porridge. Yeah. Um, so along those lines of like a porridge or oats, things like that, um, that are really easily digestible and also nourishing for the, for the, the gut. Um, a lot of things like a lot of mushrooms are really good. Um, cordyceps, reishi, turkey tail, chaga, all of those adaptogenic mushrooms. Um, and then just good old vitamin C, vitamin D, zinc. Um, and then I, I've also myself been taking. I've been doing reishi mushroom capsules. I've also been doing uh, some Chinese herbal formulas, which you have to have a prescription from a Chinese herbalist to get those. Um, and then you can also do uh, astragalus or ginseng are also really good. So oh, Okay. So I thought ginseng was could be very heating. Am I wrong about that? So ginseng is... Ginseng is warming and it's also ascending and so is astragalus. Um, so you have to be with any of these things. I mean, you have to listen to your body, right? So, um, you have to just see how you react to them because some people, if, if you start taking these things and you start feeling overheated, um, you know, literally that's a sign that you're getting too much of that, that warming nature. So you just want to make sure that you're listening to your body. If you're taking anything, especially if it's things that you don't normally take. Notice if you're starting to sweat more or feel overheated or having like hot flashes and things like that. And, and you can play around with the dosage of those things and, you know, maybe take a little bit less and see if that fixes it um, or just play around with what you're taking and how much you're taking of it. Just listen okay, to your great. body though. Yeah, that's great to know. So, you know, Chinese medicine completely changed my life with all of these things. Like, so I had never... I, I started using Chinese medicine actually maybe about like a year after we originally met. Um, and I had never known just how many things that acupuncture and herbs could heal and fix for people. I think I had been like other Americans where I always thought acupuncture and Chinese medicine was just for like your bad shoulder or like, you know, all these yeah. things that people originally think of this for. Um, and I have some, um, consistent health problems that herbs are the Chinese herbs are the only thing that helped me like literally of all the things that I've tried. Um, and so I have become an insane Chinese medicine enthusiast. Like I'm constantly telling people how great it is. Um, and I'm always so excited when I see things you share. Um, I think in like another life, I was also, you know, a, a acupuncturist and a Chinese doctor because I just think it is so <laughs> amazing and it just can help everything. And, um, you know, one of the things that's been a bummer for me out here in Thailand is it's actually very hard to get Chinese formulas out here um, because they don't import them here. And so you can go to little shops and find like Thai herbs and the occasional Chinese herb, but it's hard to find the actual formulas for anything. Um, and so, you know, I actually, right now, I don't have access to Chinese formulas, which in a pandemic is sort of breaking my heart because I wish I did. Um, but I'm also so happy to hear some of these just more like general lifestyle things um, that we can do. Um, and something little like that I've noticed about myself because of working with Chinese medicine is I'm very aware that I can't really do raw food almost at all or mm -hmm. cold food almost at all. Um, I love smoothies and I love salads, but if I have more than one, um, within like a three day period, I just notice that my digestion is not as strong. It's not as good. Um, I don't feel as energetic. And so knowing the principles of Chinese medicine, you know, most of the world would say smoothies are great. Salads are great. Um, but I'm actually, because of TCM, very aware that those things are not good for my body type and they don't make me feel good and they're not strengthening my body against potential pathogens or, you know, disease or anything of that nature. Um, so I well, love if, that. If you also think about like the way that cold works, it constricts things, right? So mm -hmm. when cold constricts things, it constricts blood vessels, it inhibits blood flow. It's the same thing with your digestion. Cold slows things down. So. Um, actually I, I recommend that most people don't 
do smoothies, don't do cold drinks. I mean, there's the occasional, like men, men sometimes are different, but for most women, I, I mean, I specialize in women's health and this is a conversation I have with women all the time because we are different because we lose blood every month. And so in a lot of, in a lot of other cultures outside of Western, the Western world, women work to replenish those fluids on a consistent basis as they're losing them. Whereas in the West, we don't do that. And um, so we are more susceptible to what we classify in Chinese medicine as blood deficiency. And we can accumulate cold in our bodies because we're losing blood. So we're getting colder in our bodies. We don't have the substances that, that keep things revved up and keep things moving. So yeah. if you have the susceptibility to that, and then on top of it, you're putting cold things in your body and slowing things down even more, you're actually exacerbating the issues. Yep. Yeah. It's really fascinating. So considering like this pandemic and what's going on, I saw you post something online um, the other day about how 85% of cases in China were also being treated with Chinese medicine while being treated by Western medicine. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah. So um, I believe it was February 10th, the Chinese government mandated that all confirmed COVID patients be treated with Chinese herbal medicine. Um, and so in conjunction with the antivirals that the Western doctors were offering. So um, they started doing this and they started seeing really great results. And this is nothing new. Um, Chinese medicine, Chinese herbal medicine has been used in pandemics. For in the last 2000 years, there's been over 320 pandemics in China or epidemics in China. And if you look at the statistics, they've actually been able to maintain their population pretty well with all things considered. And, it, and in my opinion, that's directly indicative of the efficacy of herbal medicine, because for a long time before Western medicine and pharmaceuticals really became a thing, that's all they had. And they knew how to use those things to both prevent and treat these illnesses. Um, so yeah, they've been using that in the treatment of COVID in China and getting really great results. Um, and they used it in the SARS epidemic a few years ago, or back in 2007, I think it was. Um, uh, we've actually, there was a Chinese scientist that was given the Nobel Peace Prize a few years ago for her work looking at the properties of the herb um, Artemisia, which is Ching Hao. It's been used to treat malaria. So these are, these, these are things that have been used um, even very recently. Uh, and so, yeah. And in the West now, you know, it's a completely different story because one, we're looking at the statistics from China, which are, you know, and in, in, it's an integrative system and they're using herbal medicine. So these statistics aren't necessarily going to be applicable here. And two, we don't have the infrastructure or the access to herbal medicine or the acceptance by the general public and the American Medical Association to administer this medicine here in that way. Um, and, you know, it's been, it's been a really, really hard uh, thing for me to deal with the last two weeks watching this unfold and knowing that I have these resources and these tools and I can't use them necessarily mm -hmm. right now. It's been really difficult. Um, Can you not use them just because of not coming close to patients or because of the lack of access to herbs right now? The supply chain in the United States is pretty, it's pretty difficult to get herbs right now. Um, given a lot, there's a lot of reasons, but also um, it's the supply chain. And it's also the fact that we aren't integrated into hospital systems and you're not going to integrate the hospital systems during a pandemic. It's just not realistic. Yes. So it, this is not the time to do it. Um, so, you know, and, and a lot of people will say, you know, there isn't research to back this up. Well, the problem with research and evidence-based medicine when it comes to herbal medicine is what people don't understand is that herbal medicine is not a one size fits all. We, we look at each person, we diagnose each person exactly where they are um, and exactly how their symptoms are presenting. And we modify our herbal formulas based on that. So we might use a, a base formula, but we might add a couple herbs for this and that for that person. So this isn't something that we can give this formula to 10 or a hundred people and study all of the results because it just, it doesn't work like that. So yeah. It's hard to have a controlled, a controlled study for that reason. I've heard that before from other acupuncturists and how the measurements are not the same in Western medicine as it is in Chinese medicine. And so like, like sort of the concept of like when Chinese talk about heat in the body, like, how do you measure that? 
it's not, it's not like scientifically measurable, even though that's the concept around how it's diagnosed and it works. Um, yeah. is that correct? That yeah. was sort I mean, of, this is, this is, this is an empirical medicine. We have data from thousands of years, um, of this being used effectively, but you know, just because that doesn't fit into a lot of these boxes that we've created within, you know, evidence-based medicine in the West more recently, people think that it's not, um, it's not legitimate, but it's just that it's hard to fit it into the box. Um, yeah. the, the interesting thing is though, is that, you know, the way that we treat disease, I mean, we have, we have a textbook, it's called the Shang Han Lun, and it is one of the four textbooks we study. And it is, it outlines the treatment and diagnostics of epidemics. So it literally gives us a step-by-step on how to treat and how to diagnose any kind of pathogenic invasion into the body. So virus, bacteria, fungus, whatever. Um, And it says that when a pathogen enters your body, it goes progressively deeper and deeper and deeper. There's six stages that it can go through. Um, And so as it gets deeper, there are different symptoms that present and different things and different patterns to diagnose. So we, when we're treating, for example, if someone comes into my office with the flu, if they just have gotten symptoms, I'll ask them what their symptoms are. I'll ask, are you hot? Are you cold? Are you a little bit of both? I'll look at their tongue, et cetera. And then I'll decide what stage they're in. And if it's early enough, our, our theories and our treatment strategy is to pull it back out of the body before it can go deeper. Um, mm. and it, it works. I mean, I've been using this for five years now to, and I've, I've come in contact with cold and flu multiple times and I've never, ever been sick for longer than a day maybe because I know wow. how, to, I know how to pull it back out before it goes deeper. Um, mm-hmm. it's just, a, it's just a different lens, but it works. It's really yeah. effective. Yeah. I've had it work on me for, for cold and flu as well. Um, in fact, the minute I start getting sick, the first thing I do is go to my acupuncturist and, um, start treating it with herbs and with acupuncture because I've had, um, a few common colds that the only thing that gets rid of them is doing Chinese medicine. Well, and the good thing about both acupuncture and herbs is that not only do we have these herbs that are antibacterial and antiviral, but we also have herbs that help to boost the immune system and strengthen the body as we're treating it. So, you know, even if you're taking Western medicine, antivirals or antibacterial, then if you take herbs in conjunction with the medicine, we can be building up your body, helping the, helping the medicine, the pharmaceuticals work to get rid of the pathogen, but also be keeping your body, keeping your body's integrity as you're having these harsh side effects from the medication and continuing to build the immune system up to protect the body. So it exactly. works so well together. And that's the thing that's missing in Western medicine is we just don't build the immune system up. You know, like we're very good at killing things in Western medicine and we're not so good at building things. And I think that's what's so incredible about Chinese medicine is it's really all about building the body's strength so that, you know, you can actually get rid of things or fight things off, you know, with your body's natural functioning. Yeah. And the, I mean, the point one of the points of Chinese medicine is to just keep the body in a state of balance and a state of homeostasis. And that goes for all your systems, for your digestion, for your immune system, for your hormones, you know? And it's like, if you are able to promote that homeostasis in the body and you do that on a regular basis, I mean, for most people, you know, it's like a monthly thing. If you're, if you're seeing an acupuncturist regularly and you're keeping your immune system built up, you go into cold and flu season with that built up and that accumulation of your, you know, the strengthening of your immune system, then you're not going to get sick in the first place. Or when you do, your body is in a much better place to handle it. And that's the way that we look at it is just prevention first. And then, you know, Western medicine is amazing. Like I'm not anti-Western medicine, I'm not anti-pharmaceutical. Like if someone needs a surgery, please, if someone needs medication, please. But like, we can do a lot to keep people from getting to that point. A hundred percent. I am so on board with you. I wish Chinese medicine was integrated into every hospital in America. I mean, the things that we could be doing right now to support people, if we had that infrastructure, I mean, it would be incredible. And, um, it breaks my heart that it's not 
integrated and people don't even know. I mean, most people I talk to don't even know, you know, what herbal medicine can do for them, um, which is just, you know, really unfortunate. And I'm, I'm really hoping that that changes, which was part of why I wanted to have this conversation today, just to educate people and even just give them a few um, ideas about what they can be doing now to keep themselves safe and, and healthy and protected. Um, you know, and hopefully they'll take that with them going forward, you know, when things are calmer and we're not in the middle of a global crisis. And that way we can prevent, you know, for the next time anything happens, God forbid, in the world. Yeah. I mean, I'm hoping that this pandemic actually creates an opportunity to bring Chinese herbs to the forefront. And maybe that, maybe it will. Um, I, I mean, all I can say is for everyone right now, I think the biggest thing is to just be eating as, as fresh as possible, eat real food, um, you know, strengthen your immune system through nutrition. It's the easiest way to do it. Um, you know, lots of greens, lots of fresh vegetables and fruit, um, warm foods, warm drinks, vitamin C. So lots of, you know, lots of citrus. Um, let me see anything else. And don't um, touch anybody. And, don't t- and yeah, please wash your hands. <laughs> well, wash your hands, stay inside, and don't touch anybody. <laughs> yeah. That we have to caveat now everything with that. <laughs> oh my gosh. I know. I'm glad we're all, we're all, we've all gotten a really good lesson at how to appropriately wash our hands though. It's great. <laughs> <laughs> it's very true. I think Americans needed that lesson. Among other is there anything? Is there anything else that you want to share just about the nature of things right now or, you know, what, what you're seeing or what you're inviting or just anything we didn't cover in this chat that you would just want to share with people. Um, about all this. I, I think that, you know, if we think about, I think this is a really scary and unsure time. Um, and in that uncertainty also lies a lot of opportunity and a lot of potential. Um, I think everyone just needs to be gentle on themselves. And if you have feelings of anxiety, feelings of depression, that's, totally normal and, um, you know, allow yourself to have those feelings, but also just know that getting stuck in, in spiraling in those places for too long are damaging to the immune system. And also, um, it doesn't serve, it doesn't serve you. So, you know, I would just say, try to find the balance with that. Allow yourself to have the the day of crying in bed when you need it, um, and not feel guilty about that, but also just, just Try not to stay in that for too long. I know that there's a lot of potential that, and a lot of potential good that can come out of this situation. I love that. I 100% agree. And I was sort of saying to someone the other day, I feel like there's almost two viruses going on right now. You know, we have the physical virus and what we're dealing with in the, in the physical world. And then we have this virus of fear and anxiety and panic you know, and, and both need to be dealt with right now. They're both very serious concerns and um, one will feed the other. And, you know, it's, it's important for us to be paying attention to taking care of our mental health and, you know, just everything that we can do to keep ourselves as calm and as center as we possibly can amidst all of the chaos and the noise. And then while we're dealing with this very real physical pathogen. Yeah. And it's, I mean, you know, our basic security and basic safety is threatened right now. So there's no, there's no right or wrong way to handle this. It's a really, it's really, really intense and it's really scary. So, you know, just everyone be gentle on yourself. You know, the last thing I want to ask you is, so if someone is getting sick, if um, they are showing symptoms, is there any hope for them to be getting Chinese herbs right now? Or is that just kind of, it's not going to happen at the moment? There, there are practitioners throughout the United States who are doing telemedicine and who are prescribing herbs. So um, after this call, I will, um, I'll share that document with you and we can maybe put that out for people. Um, you do have to talk to someone that is in your state. They do have to be licensed in the state that you are calling them from. So just keep that in mind, but yeah, I will give you that resource and we can get that out to people too. Amazing. And also how can people find you if they would like to find you? You can find me on Instagram at Allison Shirts, A L L Y S O N S C H U R T Z. Um, and my website is www.allisonshirts.com. I love it. Thank you so much. I'm so happy to reconnect with you. I'm so and happy to reconnect with you too. Yeah, I can't wait for people to see this and to get their own new insight on this 
amazing perspective. Hey, so thanks for making it happen. Allison.